Today, we're gathering around the campfire with Robert, a QHS member whose life is as exciting and grounding as a hike through the mountains. But what trails did he tread to reach these heights? Let's trek into the wilderness and discover the adventures that led Robert to where he is today. Hello, QHS family. I'm Robert. I was born in 1944 in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And I've lived in the Ohio in the United States for most all of my life. My family came from Ireland, the northern part of Ireland, and are unusual Irish people because they're Protestants. Some of them settled in Connecticut, some in Western Pennsylvania, which is our group, and somebody in Mississippi. So far as I know, the Ohio group hasn't produced anybody who's famous. I was raised in a small town outside of Cleveland, in the, well, in Cleveland then for a little while, and then a small town uh, until I went to college in 1950, 1962. We were Protestants and active in the church. I was somewhat active in the church, but a bit of a rogue. The youth minister, minister uh, complained about me to one of my friends. The trouble with Bob, you see, is he doesn't want to take anything on faith. He wants to experience God directly. And I thought, well, what's wrong with that? Other than that, I didn't get in any trouble. My parents were both from similar cultures. My dad was from Youngstown, which is near Pennsylvania. Mom from Garfield Heights, which is near Cleveland. And they're both college graduates for that time. That was a bit unusual because that was during the Depression. Uh, we were, I guess you would say, middle class. My father ended up running his own business in that small town as a print shop. And mom was a stay-at-home mother for the most part. She was a school teacher briefly. My parents provided a safe and loving household. I have no complaints about being traumatized or abused. I was the middle of three children. I have an older sister and a younger one who's now deceased. So in a month, I will be 80 years old. So there's a lot to tell, but probably don't need to hear all of it. I guess I was raised in the Eisenhower era where we thought America was the center of the universe and everything was just cool. Then the 60s came along when I was in college. As far as difficulties in the childhood, I was quite sickly. I was very small at birth, about five pounds, but not exactly premature. My mother told me that she looked at this tiny baby and felt alarmed. Is he going to make it or not? I don't think I was seriously ill as a small child until I was three. At that time, I contracted pneumonia and was admitted to the city hospital. They thought I might have meningitis. It was pretty serious. I have very few memories of that. I remember being in a crib that felt like a, a prison because it had iron bars on it. And I remember that I got a lot of injections. This was in 1947, and the only antibiotic available was penicillin, which was a short-acting form, so every four hours. <laughs> so I developed a fear of needles after that. I had pneumonia three more times before I left for college. One of those required hospitalization. So if I had any traumas in my childhood, it was that. The result of all that is that I was incredibly skinny. In the ninth grade, I was six feet tall and weighed 112 pounds. So I wrestled at 112 pounds without having to make weight. There was a certain amount of, I suppose you could say bullying by the football player types. I dealt with all that by relying on my strengths, which were intellectual. When I went to college, uh, my older sister had gone to a small college in Ohio. 
and I was considering such a thing, but our guidance counselor said, you need to look at the Ivy League. So I ended up going to Yale College and graduating from there, cum laude, in 1966. From there to medical school at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, graduating in 1970. And then I took training as a specialist in psychiatry, adult psychiatry. Somewhat later, I got a fellowship in forensic psychiatry, which is law and psychiatry. So I say all that not to brag, but to show the background I had to overcome later. Another little trauma from my childhood was, childhood was at age four. My parents had just bought a piano for my sister to take lessons on and a beat up old upright. And I was looking at this amazing thing, which made such amazing sounds in the living room. And I saw a shimmering, beautiful white horse with wings standing in front of it. And I could feel the love pouring out of this spirit animal. And felt that he had come for me. And I didn't know what that meant. So I went in the kitchen and I asked, Mommy, Mommy, why is there a white horse in the living room? And she looked terrified and said, there's no white horse in the living room. It's your imagination. So I learned that seeing spirit beings would make my mother upset. And I stopped being able to do that. I, I don't blame her for that. She had no idea what to do about it. And posthumously, we have talked about that and solved whatever problem we have about it. Subsequently, my oldest child, my daughter, who was an artist, went to art school. I asked her to paint a shamanic drum for me. And so I have a photograph I can add to this offering of that drum, which depicts Pegasus. Uh, pretty close to how I saw him later when he returned as I was an adult. I was introverted, not very social, but I did have a group of friends who were on the more intellectual side from that small school. There were 98 in my graduating class. And we were very interested in spiritual life. So we would sometimes meditate and pray together. Having learned that uh, it was wrong to try to experience God directly, which I thought was baloney, uh, and learned that reading the autobiography of a yogi meant I had left the church. That's what the minister's wife told me. I started struggling with having to shut up about what I was really interested in. So while going to college and medical school, I, on the side, read all sorts of spiritual material, such as I, I read everything by Hermann Hesse, for example. And in my subsequent psychiatric practice, I kept looking for ways to address the spiritual needs of my patients without a whole lot of success. I tried helping them to meditate in ways I was learning in a spiritual group I was connected to. And it never really sort of took hold. Then I had an experience in the mid-90s when my oldest was at art school and I was visiting her there for parents' weekend, I decided to walk to the hotel from her dorm room on Saturday night because it wasn't very far. And since it was raining, I borrowed her umbrella, which was red and had lace on the edges. It was about a mile through downtown Providence, Rhode Island. I had heard that Providence is not the kind of place you want to walk around at night at that time but I felt invulnerable, so I walked down the hill and started walking across the town square, which was vacant entirely and quite dark except for the hotel, which was all lit up at the far end, maybe 150 yards away. As I'm walking along with a bunch of office buildings on the left and a park on the right, I heard a voice. 
The voice said, there's a man in the alley. He's going to run out and grab you. Well, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not supposed to hear voices. I'm supposed to fix that in people. Okay, so what do you do when you start hearing voices at the age of 48 or 9 or whatever that was? It's not schizophrenia at that age. I said, what? So the voice repeated himself in an annoyed fashion. There's a man in the alley. He's going to run out and grab you. Oh, okay, okay. I don't mean to offend, but what should I do? Should I make a mad dash forward across the alley? Or should I run across the park and go down the other side? Just walk across the alley. So I walked across the alley, thinking this is the most ex interesting thing I've ever had happen to me. And a man indeed came running out of the alley, about my height, but much more fit and younger. Grabbed my left arm. And I turned toward him slowly, dropping the umbrella off my right hand, and looked him in the eyes. And he looked at me. And he said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and he ran away. And then my knees started to shake, and I wobbled back to the hotel and wondered about what just happened to my worldview. There are invisible beings of intelligence who are watching me and giving me guidance. This is not mental illness. What is it? So I promptly forgot all about it, pushed it back as far as I could. But it kept nagging at me, so this led me to work on taking inform information in from other sources than the medical world and trying to develop my intuitive skills. I did that by writing down dreams and so forth and gradually got introduced to hands-on energy work through a teacher in California who had students in Cleveland with whom I studied also. And from there, I went into shamanic journeying studies through the Foundation for Shamanic Studies and eventually others connected to that or in some loose way. Learning how to journey, learning how to do extractions of negative energies, uh, learning how to do soul retrieval, and then going to study with someone who taught how to remove spirits from people. In that class, which was a five-day intensive in Oregon at a retreat center, the teacher handed out a list of all the signs and symptoms of spirit attachment. And this eight and a half by 11 page was a complete list of every known psychiatric symptom. And I thought, boy, I am in trouble. I have to rethink everything I'm doing. And people would come up to me and they would say, Bob, how do you know if somebody's got spirit attachments or they have a real chemical imbalance? And I said, I have no idea. I'm new at this. <laughs> but there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. That's a fiction. That's not scientific fact. At any rate, one thing led to another and I, having fathered three children by two different women, on my third wife, and the third time is the charm. She is Barbara, and she is a QHS member also. She had been doing similar work from different sources of learning how to deal with past life traumas, earthbound spirits, darker entities, and so forth. And we became involved and became married in 2016. Her work is called Soul Detective, so that's what I do now. I'm a certified soul detective. So what does that mean? In my early days of doing hands-on work, I had a client on my treatment table uh, doing energy work with her. She had Crohn's disease and had a lot of belly pain. She'd had surgery on her guts to remove parts of her intestine. And after I did my little energetic thing, the pain was a lot less and she was a lot calmer. And she looked up at me from the table and in a plaintive voice asked me, Doctor, can you heal my soul? 
And I realized I didn't have a clue how to do that. So everything that came after the shamanic journeying and the depossession work and so on and the soul detective work is about that, addressing that question, how do we heal the soul? So that's the backdrop for me coming into QHS. I became interested in whether there are technical instruments that can be useful in dealing with illnesses in a different way uh, than modern medicine does, and dealing with the spirits that attach to people. And so I've run through a, a fair amount of coin in doing that, buying gizmos of one kind and another, and then following the advice of Alex Collier, who I've been following for two, three years now, he recommended the QHS thing, so we got into that. Since meeting Barbara, my diet has greatly improved. I have stopped doing any drinking of alcohol. I wouldn't consider myself ever to have been dependent on it, but I had a few close calls here and there. So I haven't had a drink for four years, more or less. And I eat a pretty healthy diet. We have some differences of opinion about some things here and there. Uh, but pretty much it's very healthy. She has a big garden and a greenhouse, and we eat a lot of stuff that's fresh out of our own property. I'm a little uh, short on the exercise and physical activity. I do not have any current serious medical conditions other than being old. I'm not taking any medicine for anything, uh, any prescription medicine anyway. I take some supplements and I take fenbendazole to kill off parasites because I found out that's a big deal to do. It's very important to do. So now I'm a full-time soul detective. I retired from psychiatry in 21. Don't do that anymore. And it was liberating to be able to stop thinking like a psychiatrist about issues. I have worked with guidance actively since maybe 2000, spiritual guidance. I have always felt like the dummy in the class when I'm studying healing things because everybody else seems far more intuitive than I am. But somehow I'm very drawn to approaching things in that way in regard to my clients. And they are often more intuitive than I am. But somehow I get information about what they need and what they're not seeing. So that's my great love right now is helping people by being a soul detective. I am interested in getting somehow more involved in QHS. On the other hand, I'm pretty busy with my practice and I'm doing the thing I love right now. I do not know what impact the QARC would have on the spiritual issues or any of the other devices. I think that healing what's wrong with us at various levels makes it much harder for dark spirits to attach to people and do their dirty work. So I want to see how the house feels after we've had the HHS for a while. We've had it for four days now. And I am grateful for the possibility, which I almost believe is really true. Like I could have a lot more years of health and real activity. So I'm very grateful to the QHS team, to Cynthia and Wade and Dr. Alfredo and to Alex for introducing me to this. Maybe I will be able to make a contribution in some way in the future. Join us on the prequel, where every story matters and every voice is heard. Because here at QHS, we're all about healing, learning, and growing together.